This is a talk about Australian English and the question of identity. It's probably the only variety of English in which I could risk this topic. However, the relationship between identity and language is rich and complex. When, when you ask people, uh, what are they, particularly here, I ask people, are you Catalan, are you Spanish, are you European? Uh, they give an answer, and then I ask why, and one of the first things they'll say is, well, I speak Spanish or I speak Catalan, and they won't say I speak European, and that's probably why they don't say they're European. Language is very closely related to a sense of cultural identity. I'm not going to go into theory of identity. I prefer to talk about belonging and relations of belonging. However, um, I, I uh, am intrigued by notions from Ricoeur uh, about the relationship between uh, what he calls l'identité ipse, uh, which would be the kind of identity that we manifest in relation to the other in a conversation, for example, or an exchange such as this. Uh, that he opposes to l'identité idem, which would be the repetition of the same. Um, I am today the same person I was yesterday, and my identity has something to do with the way my parents were, and my identity might have something to do with what my children are. Uh, we have these two levels, these two intersecting dimensions, the ips and the idem, uh, which I'll call exchange and repetition, just to make things simple. I, I've been looking at interviews on YouTube, interviews of Nicole Kidman uh, over the years, and I'm amazed uh, to find that an actress, a superb actress of that quality, can adopt an enormous number of, of varieties of English and use them convincingly uh, that the, the identity, ipsa, the, the, the exchange relationship is very developed. And yet in the interviews, her English, which is the English of a, a little Australian girl from the Sydney area, remains remarkably the same. It just suggests that when people say we've got to have identity problems because they use different languages in different situations, uh, you look at someone like that or at the linguistic evidence and say, well, no, it's possible to do many things on the exchange relationship and to have a fairly solid repetition of the self. I, I found just a few post vocale gars in her interviews on American television, but just a few. Australian English, it seems to me, developed in the 19th century as a variety and for much of the 20th century in relations of opposition and exchange. It carved out a space according to what it was not. Uh, it's not Cockney, it's not Irish, it's not... There are elements of Cockney there and you can find the Irish if you look, but it seemed to me more importantly something not British, not working class, not uh, RP, not dominant social class British. And certainly towards the end of the 19th century, it's something not foreign, not European, not Chinese, not Kanaka. It's this racist identity and bellicose identity that affirms itself as being not what the other is and the empty space is then filled in with, with variants. It couldn't be an identity idem. It couldn't be a relationship of repetition of the self over time because there simply was not time. The fewer than a hundred years were there to establish any kind of linguistic basis for an identity. And this might explain why in the textbooks we, we do find Australian English being described in terms of levels. You have careful Australian English, close to RP, general Australian spoken in the street by almost everybody these days on television, 
and broad Australian uh, spoken by workers. However, Australian society being what it is, uh, I can do careful if I have to, to teach. I can do broad if I have to, when I worked on the mines and as a mechanic and all the other things that Australians tend to do. And I can do general if I have to as well. And most people can. Most can shift between these levels uh, uh, of being broadly Australian and being very close to RP. Uh, those are the dynamics of a kind of code switching, in fact. Uh, some examples. Traditionally, the Australian woman in the family, in the well-off family, I must admit, in, in the farming families, which is where I'm from, the woman is the one who says she's there to maintain proper English, which is British English, and she will lament the way the children and the men speak. Also, I note when I went to university first in the, nine, in the 1970s, uh, one changed automatically from general Australian to careful Australian. On campus, careful Australian. Uh, off campus in the city, general Australian, a broad Australian if we had to go and work. And that was done without thinking as a mode of code switching. Another example, that's quite subtle though, um, two years ago in Australia I'm listening to university students in a train and uh, they're expressing their identity in very broad Australian. Australian has become more uh, proud of itself and university students now no longer uh, are engaged in that dynamic of, of, of the cultural cringe with uh, British culture. But I hear them using uh, American lexical items. I guess the, the, the opposition now, the exchanges with the American culture more than British. And so they'll be saying things that it's like awesome, which is American language, but with very strong Australian phonetic features. Uh, language has many levels. You can do one thing on one level, that is absorb American youth culture, and something else on another level, on the phonetic level, affirm your Australian identity, both at the same time. In general, though, what's happened, certainly since uh, I lived in Australia, since the 1970s, uh, since I haven't lived in Australia, um, the variety has become stronger, that the use of general Australian uh, has overwhelmed the remnants of careful Australian, uh, to the extent that when I meet my former professors, I think they're pretending to be Australian because they're, 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 the English is so broad, the Australian English is so broad. Uh, where in fact what had happened is that in the 1970s we were pretending to be British people. And they've now gone back to what they always were, perhaps. The result is that these days especially, Australian English, from about 4,000 kilometers from one side of the continent to the other, uh, has very, very, little variation. You know, in Britain, you've got Trudgill's Triangle, where uh, the higher the social class, the less regional variation. So you can tell when a person speaks their regional location, if they're from the lower class, middle class or lower class, and their class location, if they are higher up the scale. It's a bit like... Uh, the uncertainty principle. You can't make both observations at the same time, but, but in between that you can get class and or region. And you can locate people, and this is why accent, the way one speaks, is very, very important in, in Britain. In Australia, you can go from rich to poor, from east to west, north to south, and not really know. Remarkably, in those few years, I guess 30 years since the 1970s, we formed a space of identité idem, repetition of the self, repetition of the same. My God, it's boring, and perhaps that's why I had to leave. <laughs>